can see that we are getting there. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. Let us be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone, so we be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And verse 12 is very important for our discussions this afternoon. The Bible says, for the word of God, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So those are very important things. Number one is that it is living. It has life in it. Number two, it is powerful. For those who are joining, we are reading from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. We are reading from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. That the word of God is living, it is powerful, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a designer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart of men. So the first thing that is that it is living, so there is, there is life, there is life in the word of God, the second thing is that it has power. It is powerful, but it is not only living and powerful, but it is also effective in terms of what it does. That it is, it is effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. That there is some work it does. There is a difference it brings when it gets into a person. And therefore today, I want us to have discussions and conversations around the power of the word, the power in the word of God, the power in the word of God. Uh, please mute once you joined and uh, uh, kindly ensure that uh, you mute, you mute so that we are able to continue together. So the power in the word of God and what I had started uh, uh, with uh, before we couldn't be able to communicate, as I said, everything that is powerful must have a place where it derives its power from and, and and that is called authority and the question we i wanted us to answer is where does the scriptures derive their authority from so the first question we ask ourselves before we even talk of the power in this word is where does it derive its authority from the power not only of the word of god but the power of even books that we read if i pick up a scientific book to read and and, and, I, and I want to go through it the first question I want to ask myself is how 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 reliable is it and the reliability of any book is from the author the, it, if any, any material any written material derives it of its authority from the author and so the question we must ask ourselves is who is the author who authored who authored um, the Bible and we had gone to the book of Second Timothy. Um, today we'll read quite a number of um, verses, so you'll bear with me. Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse, verse, verse 16. I know this is a word that many of us are familiar with. Second Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Or not, not some of them. All scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Meaning that even though there are men who are used in writing the Bible, the originator of the scriptures is God himself. The originator of scriptures is God himself. The man who penned down acted as scribes writing what they had and were inspired to write so they were writing what god was inspiring them to write and there is some words in the book of uh, psalm chapter 12 verse 6 psalm chapter 12 verse 6 uh, also speaks about um the man of god psalm and i can see most people are still not able to hear me I am seeking that uh, if you are able um, to get in touch with somebody, tell them to exit the meeting and then rejoin. Exit the meeting and then rejoin. And that way, 
they will be able to, uh, uh, to hear me. So if somebody tells you that they can't hear me, just tell them to exit the meeting and then rejoin again. Uh, and then when they do that, they will be able to hear me. They will be able to hear me. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen Dirango. I can see you have exited and joined. Um, many do not still have audio, but I hope uh, they will be able to, to do that. So we go to the book of Psalm 12 verse 6. I want to give you an example of these others, what, what, what they acted. So Psalm um, 12 verse, verse 6, the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words. The words of the Lord are pure words. Like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And I want to use those words to bring to you um, the image of the authors of scriptures and, and, and how they were used by God. So the Bible here is saying that the words of the Lord are pure words. They are pure words. Like silver tried in a furnace of earth. And I want to bring three people here. I want to bring the Lord. I want to bring the Holy Spirit who is the one that God uses to inspire the writing of scripture and then I want to use the authors who wrote if it's Peter, if it's John, if it's um, Mark and, and I want us to look at those three and use this example to bring them out and what we are saying is that so the words of the Lord are the silver the words of the Lord are the silver that we are seeing here being purified the Holy Spirit is the fire that purifies this silver and the furnace of earth are the human authors who are writing so the human authors are the furnace are the other furnace the bible says that we are other vessels we are other vessels and these other vessels are holding treasures are holding treasures so the the fire if the, the 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 furnace of earth is the human author the silver that is being purified are the words of the Lord and the purifier. The fire that is purifying these words that they may come out purified is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. So God inspires his words through the Holy Spirit. And therefore, even, even if human authors are the ones who wrote these words for us, they, they were used by God who inspired them through the Holy Spirit and they are able now to write words that get to us and become a blessing to us. This means that although the silver is going through another furnace, it belongs to God. It belongs to God. It means that even if these words are going through human beings to get to us, they, are, they, they belong to God. And it is God who is getting them out to us that we may be able to understand um, what he is saying. When you read the book of uh, John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 25, John chapter 14, um, verse 25, John chapter 14, uh, 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 verse uh, 25 and 26, you will see that Jesus is telling the disciples that after I have gone, after I'm gone, the Holy Spirit whom I will send, so I'm moving slowly so that we walk together. The Holy Spirit whom I will send to you will bring to remembrance all the things that I have told you will bring to remembrance. Maybe you can go there. John 14, 25. I said we will read very many uh, portions of scripture. Um, John, and please mute your um, mute, mute yourself so that there is no feedback. John. So we are going to John 14, 25. John 14, verse 25. The Bible says, if you're there, um, John 14, 25, the Bible says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Because you may ask yourself, how comes that John can remember all these things that he writes to us? How comes that Luke or Matthew? But here is the secret, that when Jesus was leaving, he told them that the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will, number one, teach you all things, and number two, bring to remembrance all the things that I have said to you. And therefore, as I read the Gospel of Matthew, as I read the letters of Peter, as I read the letters of John, as I read the Gospel of Luke, something that I must always remind myself is that what they, have, they are writing are things that either they are being taught by the Holy Spirit or they are being brought to remembrance. In a, Jesus had taught them, but now they are being brought to their remembrance by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. And therefore, as we look at the power of the Word of God, we must remember that it derives its, its authority from its author. And its author is God himself, who through the Holy Spirit inspired men, earthen vessels, to write these things, which were not their own things, but were things that belonged to God. The silver belongs to God. The earthen furnace is, 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 is what the human author is. And the fire, the purifying agent, is the Holy Spirit who purifies that silver that comes to us as the word of God. The best interpreter then, as after you've talked about the authority, the best interpreter of any writing is the author of that writing. And therefore I must say, without fear of contradiction, that the best author, the ultimate interpreter, the ultimate interpreter of the scriptures, the ultimate interpreter of the word of God is the Holy Spirit. Whether people write volumes of books, and I have written books myself, they must rely on the Holy Spirit to become the ultimate interpreter of the Word of God. And even a work that is written purporting to interpret the Scriptures is not deriving its interpretation from the Holy Spirit, then that work cannot effectively be able to interpret the word of God. All of us have been given an opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all of us have been given an opportunity to receive the interpreter of the word of God. And therefore, even as I speak this afternoon, I must rely a hundred percent on the Holy Spirit to interpret, to interpret scripture to any of us, including myself. And like I have said, none of us, none of us does not have the opportunity. If you read the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 13, the Bible says that we, human fathers, are able to give good gifts to our children. And it asks, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Brethren, if the Holy Spirit is the ultimate interpreter of Scripture, then you and me have an opportunity to have the Scriptures interpreted to us by the Holy Spirit as we walk together with Him. And even when we listen to sermons and preachings like we are doing today, we must always rely on the Holy Spirit for illumination. And therefore, if be, there be anyone who have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord is saying to you in Luke eleven thirteen that the Lord will give you the Holy Spirit, that he may be able to interpret the scriptures to you. It is okay to go to Bible school, and I have gone there myself. It's okay to read commentaries. It's okay to read Bible dictionaries. It's okay to read concordances. But I must remind you, that these must never replace the place of the Holy Spirit when it comes to interpretation of Scripture, when it comes to understanding of Scripture, when it comes to application of Scripture. No matter how many commentaries we read, no matter how big they are, no matter how far we rise 
I have a master's in biblical studies. That master's degree must never replace the place of the Holy Spirit in terms of the interpretation of scripture. We can have great preachers preaching to us. And I want to believe by the power of God. I also preach this word in, in, a, in a powerful way. But my preaching, my, 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 my sermons, my messages must never replace the place of the Holy Spirit in the interpretation of scripture. And therefore, my first call to each and every one of us today is that we must allow the Holy Spirit to take his rightful position in the interpretation of scripture in our lives. We must allow the Holy Spirit to be the one who illuminates scripture for us. That as I read my Bible, I must not rely on my human understanding. My human understanding is important. My understanding of uh, the, the, the skills that have been used in writing scripture is okay. My understanding of interpreting literature is okay. But I must always remember that they must never repraise the Holy Spirit. They must never repraise the Holy Spirit. But I must allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word and that must remain central. The Holy Spirit must remain central in interpreting the word of God. Jesus himself used scripture and we shall be able to look at that when you go to Matthew chapter 4 and we see him going through uh, the, the, the temptations that Satan brought to him after the 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. He was tempted and he used the scriptures to defend himself because it is only through scriptures that we can win battles. And I will be telling you about that. But at this point, I must add, even in terms of deliverance, the greatest deliverance in the lives of men and women do not happen when hearts are laid on people. They do not happen when people roll on the floor. They do not happen when foam comes out of the mouth. The greatest deliverance in the lives of men and women happens when they, lead, they read and understand the word of God. When they allow the word of God to get into them and to bring a transformation in their lives, that is when the greatest deliverance happens. It doesn't happen when we lay hands and we shall lay hands on people. We shall exercise demons from uh, the lives of people. But I want to say that the greatest deliverance happens. The greatest deliverance happens when the greatest deliverance happens when people read and understand the word of God, the word of God. Battles are not won when we fight so much. They are won when we apply the word of God. And Jesus himself knew that. Jesus himself knew that. And the devil's key always is to make us doubt the word of God. And, and that is what he did. And I would like you to look at, 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 at Eve and to look at Jesus Christ. When the devil came to Eve, he told Eve that, did, 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 you, did your God say? So he is trying to make Eve doubt what the Lord had said. And Eve fell to the trap of the enemy. But when he came to Jesus and told him, it is written, Jesus used the word, Jesus used the scriptures to counter. Jesus used the scriptures to counter what was being said. And he won. And he was not, he did not fall. He fell because she did not take what God had told them and made use of it. And made use of it. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5 verse 17 that he did not come to destroy the prophets and the law. Matthew 5 verse 17. And, and you see, during his day, um, the reference, the prophets and the law, referred to the scriptures that they had then. And he said, I did not come to destroy the prophets and the law, but I came to fulfill. I came to fulfill. So he was simply saying that I came to fulfill the scriptures. And how did Jesus fulfill the scriptures? Through his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Through all those he fulfilled what had been written, what had been said by the prophets. And therefore, in Jesus Christ, we see the fulfillment of Scripture. In Jesus Christ, we see the fulfillment of Scripture. Let, let me now get to 
the title of my message today, The Power in the Word of God. The Power in the Word of God. And I want to share with us six things that the Word of God does in our lives. There may be so many others. These are not just the things that the Word of God does. There are many others it does. But allow me to share with you six of these things. Number one, the Word of God brings or births faith in us. The Word of God brings or births faith in us. We can go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10. Romans 10, verse 17, if you're there. Romans 10, verse 17, let's get there. You can see we are getting there, Romans 10, verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. And the Bible says, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So I have said, that the word of God brings or births faith in us. Many times as a believer, the, 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 the basis of our Christian life is faith. But there is no faith without the hearing. There is no faith without the word of God. There is no faith without the word of God. It is not everything that we hear that births faith. But the word of God does bad faith. We therefore need to look, we don't need to look too far. You know, sometimes people feel that their faith is down, their faith is weak, their faith does not seem to be working for them, their faith. But I want to say, if you want to strengthen, if you want to bath, if you want to grow, if you want to increase your faith, go to the word of God. Go to the scriptures. And I have always said that when we read the scripture, our knowledge of God is increased. And as our knowledge of God is increased, our ability to believe, our ability to believe God is also increased. You hear through reading. And, 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 and you know, the Bible has a way of bringing this paradox. This morning, as I, we were looking at Psalm 34, we were looking at the paradox where the Bible is saying that all taste and see. So you are tasting to see. And, and here, you are reading to hear. So you are hearing through your eyes, you are hearing through your reading. And it is important for you to be able to read this, the word of God because it is through the reading, it is through the hearing of the word of God that your faith is bathed, that your faith is increased, that your faith is grown. Many of us are praying that our faith may increase. We are seeking to see miracles and hear testimonies. This is not bad. But the primary source of our faith is hearing the word of God. When you read and hear what God is saying, when you read and the Holy Spirit helps you to hear what God is saying, then you are able to grow faith. Don't panic if your faith is down. Just read the word of God. Your faith will be boosted. Your faith will be increased. Number two, the word of God cleanses us. The word of God Christ says us. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 to 27. If you read Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 to 27. Although Jesus is talking about marriage. He is giving an example and he is saying that it is through the word. He has purified like Christ have cleansed the church through his word. The Bible is therefore showing us that through the word of God we get cleansed. Through the word of God, we get, we get purified. We get that taken away from us. In uh, John 15, uh, verse 3, John 15, verse 3, Jesus himself told those, those that were with him. He was teaching them. And he was talking to them. And he was saying, you are cleansed. 
you are sanctified through the words that I have spoken to you. So when the words of God are spoken to us, they cleanse us. They make us purified. They take away all the impurities. They take away of the filthiness. But how does this happen? How does this happen? How does cleanliness come? And cleanliness has two aspects. Um, the first aspect, so walk with me slowly. I'm walking slowly today. I want us to just move slowly through this study. The first aspect of cleanliness is the removal of dirt. So, the removing of dirt. The second bit of, 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 of cleanliness is the sustenance of the person being clean. Many times, I will see my children will go out and make themselves dirty. And then when they make themselves dirty, and they are called into the house, and they are muddy and they look dirty, one of the first things that happens is that the dirty clothes are first removed. The dirt that is on them is first removed. And then the second thing is that they are, they are cautioned. They are required not to go out into the mud again. Why? Because we have removed the dirt and now we must stay clean. And that is how it works when it comes to faith, when it comes to our Christianity. I have always described righteousness in those two aspects. That there is the instant righteousness, there, there, there is the eventual, there is the instant righteousness that we receive. When our sins are forgiven and taken away, when we are purified, when we are forgiven of all the things that we did before. But there is continuous righteousness where after we have come to Christ then, we are not expected to continue in sin. After we have received grace, the Bible is asking, do we continue in sin? So that is how the word of God deals with us. So when we receive the word of God and it births faith in us, what happens is that we repent, we, we are forgiven, our sins are forgiven and taken away. And after we have been cleansed, the word of God now continually and every day helps us to continue in the purity that we have received. It, it helps us to continue in the purity that we have received. As we continue receiving the word of God, we continue receiving wisdom on how to stay away from our sin, sinful nature. We continue learning how to stay away from our sins, how not to go back to the mud. So the children come back into the house, the dirty, the dirty clothes are removed. That is what happened at salvation. The dirty clothes that were on us were removed. And then after that, through the word of God, we are taught every day how not to go back to the mud, how not to go back to the field, how not to go back to the things that we used to go into. But there is a beautiful thing in the book of James chapter 1 verse 21. And I would like us to go there. James chapter 1 verse 21. There's a, there's a beautiful thing here about how the word of God help, helps us to stay pure. The Bible says, if you're there, James chapter 1, verse 21. James chapter 1, verse 21. I can see people are getting there. So if, if, if you're there, James chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness, an overflow of wickedness. So there's the laying aside. There is the removal of the dirty clothes. There is the, 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 the that, 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 that removal of, of, of that. And receive meekness. The implanted word which is able to save your souls. But verse 22 is very nice. It sounds very good. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is a, like a man observing, observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. So what is James telling us? James is telling us 
that the word of God is like a mirror. The word of God is like a mirror. Where when we read it, when we hear it, it shows us how we are. It reveals areas that need to be acted upon. It shows the dirt that we have. This morning, before I came here, I went to the mirror to look at myself. And when I got to the mirror, I saw a white substance, a white particle that was on my beard. When I saw that white particle, I removed it from my beard. I removed it. Why? It was not, it was an unnecessary thing there. It was dirt. It was filth. That is how the word of God is supposed to be. In terms of helping us remain clean after being cleansed. That when I read the word of God, when I hear the word of God being taught, I should be able to see the reflection of myself on that mirror. And I should be able to act. I should be able to see areas I need to correct myself. I should be able to see some dirt that I need to remove from myself. And therefore, when you read the word of God, you must be ready and willing. Why? Because that word is living. That word is powerful. That word is, is, is like a sword that separates the soul from the spirit. You must read the word of God not as literature. You must read the word of God not just as another book that you're reading. But you must read it knowing that there is power. There is life. There is, there is a, it is active in terms of transformation. It is like a mirror. When you read it, when you look at it, it is, you are able to see yourself. You are able to be admonished. You are able to be warned. You are able to see how your life looks. Sometimes when we look at our lives using our worldly standards, what happens is that we see as if we are very perfect. We see as if we are doing very well. But when we allow the word of God which contains the standards of God to be the one that is measuring us, we see our crooked areas. We see the points in our lives where correction is needed. And therefore, the word of God is able to cleanse us and is able to continually enable us to continue being cleansed as a process for believers. In Psalm 119 verse 9 to 11, Psalm 119 verse 9 to 11, the word of God tells us that the only way that a young man can keep his ways pure is by hiding it in his heart. Brethren, we cannot be holy by the many uh, tactics that we shall try. <coughs> we shall try. We cannot be holy, you know, by, by trying this strategy and trying that strategy. The way to be holy, the way to be holy is to hide the word of God in our hearts. The way to walk and to live in accordance to the standards of God is to hide the word of God in our hearts. It may sound simple. It may sound like a Sunday school lesson. But you know what? Many of us are struggling with sins. Many of us are struggling with so many things when it comes to maintaining the standards of God. But the only way to conquer, the only way to win is to be able to get this word of God and have it in ourselves. Number three, the word of God instructs us. The word of God instructs us. Where we read in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17, the word of God says, and we can go there, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. Let us read verse 16. <clears throat> we say that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All scripture is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is profitable in doctrine, in reproof, in correction, but more importantly, to instruct us in righteousness. Righteousness is the standard 
of God. When you, you, you say you are righteous, if you have met the standards of God, if you're running your business according to the standards of God, if you're running your family according to the standards of God, and God has standards that he requires us to do things. Even during such a time as now that we are in a crisis, God has standards in terms of how he expects us to respond to these things that are happening to us. And it is the word of God that instructs us in terms of those standards of God. Those standards of God. The Bible further notes that when we are instructed through the word of God, we are complete. Therefore, we derive our completeness by re receiving the instruction of the word of God. We derive our completeness by receiving the instruction of the word of God. Meaning what? That when we don't receive instruction from the word of God, we are not complete. Yesterday I was reasoning to Derek Prince and he said something very powerful. He said that some of the greatest disasters that the world has gone through have been caused by educated fools. Meaning what? That education in itself has no ability to give us the wisdom that requires us or is required of us for us to be complete. That you can have education, you can have school education, but still be very incomplete, still become a fool. But we get instruction. The greatest wisdom that we receive comes from the word of God. Comes from the word of God. In Psalm 119, verse 130, Psalm 119, verse 130, Psalm 119, verse 130, the, Bible, the psalmist says that the entrance of God's word gives light. The entrance, when, when, when the word of God enters into us, it gives us light. Light. It illuminates our path. It helps us to see beyond what we can see with our worldly eyes. It illuminates that which may have been in darkness. But even great is the fact that it gives understanding to the simple. That is what the psalmist is saying. That when the word of God gets into us, it, it gives us light. And other than giving us light, it gives understanding to the simple. Do you feel like you're ignorant in so many areas? Go to the word of God. Go, it is deep. It is not education that gives understanding. Rather, it is the word of God. That we have a wealth of knowledge, but we may be ignorant because the word of God has not illuminated or has not given us, us understanding. Because we can have knowledge, but if we don't have understanding in that knowledge, then you find that we, we, we miss out. The fourth thing that the word of God does is that it is a weapon for war. The word of God is a weapon for war. Is a weapon for war. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 17. When you read Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, and it talks about the armor, the armor of God. And most of us, I know, understand this armor of God. The helmet of salvation, the blessed prayer of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes that are the readiness of spreading uh, the gospel, the shield of faith that we may quench the fiery darts of the enemy. But the only offensive weapon that we are given in uh, verse 17 we can go there I want us to look at these words together Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 the Bible says that and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God that among all the weapons that we have been given among all the, of, uh, the defensive weapons we have been given, the only offensive weapon is the word of God, which is the sword. The word of God is compared to a sword. The word of God is compared to a sword, meaning it has the ability to attack and deal with the enemy. Where we have read in Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible also has said what? Verse 12. 
that the word of God is living. It is powerful. It is a sword that has the ability to cut and separate spirit and soul, bone and marrow. So the word is typified here as a sword. This tells us that the word is very powerful. And once you have it, you have the weapon to attack. You see Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, when he is going through temptation, he uses the word to defend himself. He uses the word of God to be able to defend himself. Many of us are trying to use our human wisdom, our human knowledge, to be able to win against the devil. Some of us are using our wisdom to try and push the enemy back. But I want to tell you, there is nothing as powerful as the word of God. And like I said in the beginning, whether you are oppressed, whether the, the, there are even demons that you feel like, you know, people will talk of spirits and demons allowed their lives. The best weapon that you can use is the word of God. The word of God gives deliverance from the devil and his schemes. And I said the greatest deliverances does not happen when hands are laid on people. The greatest deliverances happen when the word of God enters people, when the word of God consumes people, when the word of God becomes a reality in the lives of men and women. That why many of us are still bowed in the world the things, why we are still bowed, why we cannot move, is because we have not given the word of God the right place in our lives. Sometimes we lead the word of God and because we are in our comfort zones, we feel it is powerful. Like when Jesus is telling the disciples that in this world you shall have many troubles, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. When we read that word, when we are comfortable and our life is doing well, we, we accept it, we receive it. We, we say today the preaching was powerful. But wait until when we get into trouble, Wait until when our lives start getting challenged. Wait until when attacks come our way. These words stop making sense in our lives. Why we have not taken those words, internalized them, and made them practical words in our lives. We have not received those words as words that have power. So, the word of God is your weapon. Don't go looking for men to pray on you. Don't go looking for prophets and such it is not the seed that you plant that will deliver you it is not the offering that you give that will make God act on your issue God acts on his word please go hear the word of God go read the word of God go study the word of God go allow the word of God to get into you and make that difference that needs to be made number five as I go towards the finish, is that the word of God provides us with spiritual nourishment. The word of God provides us with spiritual nourishment. When we hear the word of God, when we read the word of God, we are fed spiritually. Many of us are going through spiritual hunger. Many people are experiencing a lot of hunger in their spirit. But do you know that where that hunger is coming from? Is it is coming from the Bible. I can't remember where, but the Bible says, I think it's in the book of Isaiah, that a time will come when there will be famine, when there will be a drought of hearing. So the word of God will be available, but people will not want to hear it. People, some, there, there are people at times who detest the word of God. There are people sometimes who detest the word of God. And I want to pray that it is not you and me who detest the word of God. Because if you don't get the nourishment that comes from the word of God, you remain hungry. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible is saying, like, like small babes yearn for the milk, the nourishing milk that is in the word of God. And what I want to say is that the word of God is food fit for all stages of life. 
the word of God is food fit for all stages of life. And that is why even the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, would say that I cannot give you hard food. Because within the word of God, there is everything. There is food for babes, spiritual babes. There is food for those who can take meat. There is food for those who can take hard food. It is spiritual nourishment. Spiritual nourishment. Let me finish um, point number six by saying that the word of God is the antidote of false teachings. The word of God is the antidote. The antidote of false teachings. What is an antidote? An antidote is something that is given, like take for example somebody takes poison. And after somebody takes poison, then he is given some something. He is either given milk, I could see people being given milk, or is either given another medicine. And why are they being given this? They are being given that. They are being given that to deal with the effects of the poison they have already taken. So it becomes the antidote of that poison. So I'm saying the word of God is the antidote of false teachings. That if somebody has taken false teachings, if somebody has been polluted or corrupted by men and women out there who have corrupted the word of God, it is only the word of God that is able to bring that person back to the way of truth. It is only the word of God. So if you find somebody that is going astray because of the things that they have received, or if you find yourself confused by some teachings that are being taught, don't run sometimes to other men to ask them. It is okay to ask them if they will use the word of God as an antidote. It is the, it is the medicine. It is the, it is the one that deals with the effects. It is the one that deals with the effects of false teachers. If you find somebody who has been taken astray by false teachers, who have been taken astray by false doctrines, sometimes you don't even need to lay hands on them. Get them to read and understand the word of God. Get them to read and understand the word of God. And that is why we should understand the word of God very well. Because it is the one that we use to measure. Even what I'm teaching today. If you want to measure what I'm teaching today. Whether it is true or not true. Use the word of God. And I want to tell you. God never forgot to put anything in this word. And therefore if anybody. If anybody teaches you anything. That does not agree with the word of God. Please dismiss them. Leave them alone. The word of God is the antidote of false teachings. Let me conclude by saying three things. Let me conclude by saying three things. That number one, the effectiveness of the word of God in your life will only be to the extent of how you receive it. And I want to read 1 Thessalonians 2.13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. First Thessalonians 2.13. Are you there? If you're there, we shall read the word of God. First Thessalonians 2 verse 13. The Bible says, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, number one, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. When you received the word of God from us, you did not receive it as the word of men, but you received it as what it is, it truly is. And how did you receive it? As the word of God. God, which also effectively works in you who believe. How have you received the word of God? Because the effectiveness of the word of God in your life will only be to the extent of how you receive it. Ukipokea neno la mungu kwa mzaha, litakuwa kwa neno la mzaha. 
ukipokea neno la Mungu kama neno lililo na nguvu na uwezo litakuwa kwako neno lililo na nguvu na uwezo ukilipokea neno la Mungu kama neno linalofanya kazi katika maisha ya wanadamu hivyo ndivyo itakavyokuwa lakini ukilipokea kama neno lingine tu you know there are people who will read the bible as just another literature that is how it will become to you another literature not effective so the effectiveness of the word of god will only be to the extent of how you receive it it is as powerful it is as reliable it is as adequate as you receive it yourself the second thing i want to say in conclusion is that for the word of god to be able to work in you it must dwell in you richly it must dwell in you richly and that is what the bible says in colossians 3 verse 16 colossians 3 colossians 3 verse 16 the bible says let the word of christ dwell in you richly in our wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the lord so the word let the word of god dwell in you richly read it study it memorize it meditate on it and act on it do it let the word of god be in you richly in joshua chapter 1 verse 8 god is telling joshua let these words of the law the book let this this book of the law remain with you meditate upon it day and night brethren we cannot prosper if what is in us abundantly is coronavirus if what is in us abundantly is the comedies of mashangi if what is in us abundantly is the afro cinemas from the west africa if what is in us abundantly is understanding where the soap opera maria and uh, kumkumbagia and um, where they you know you can remember where maria was uh, in the first episode and maybe it is in the 10th episode but you can't remember the word of god brethren the word of god must dwell in us literally that you can explain things about how your neighbor you know speaks how your neighbor does things how please let us have the word of god dwelling in us richly dwelling in us richly dwelling in us richly let us overflow with the word of god that when we are provoked the word of god just overflows when we are pushed the word of god just overflows oh hallelujah i pray that we shall allow the word of god to be in us and to dwell in us richly the final thing i want to tell you and i've said it here before do not replace the word of god in your life with anything else do not replace the word of god in your life with anything else we have said the word of god is the one that cleanses you we have said the word of god is the one that birds faith in you we have said the word of god is the one that you use and as, as an offensive weapon to fight your battles we have said the word of god is 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 the mirror that you look at and see yourself and see areas where you need to act on we have said the word of god is the antidote of false teachings we have said that the word of god the word of god is the one that gives us spiritual nourishment please don't repress the word of god with anything else do not run to after human revelation actually one of the biggest traps why people fall for false teachers is because people are looking for new revelation there is no new revelation everything is in the word actually the bible says there is nothing new on this planet and so if anyone tells you i have a new revelation be very careful with them 
And that is why even today, I don't think I've told you anything new. So when people run after new revelation, after new things, after human wisdom, they replace the scriptures. Avoid human philosophy and wisdom in your living. Live by the word of God. Live by the word of God. Because we go back to Hebrews chapter 4. I conclude by always going back to our main text. So we go back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. As we conclude, the Bible is saying, For the word of God is living. So the word of God is living. Receive the word of God as living, as a word that has life in it. And powerful. It is powerful. Because you can be living, but you're not powerful. The word of God is living. It's actually God himself. When you read John 1, it tells us that the word was with God and the word was God. So the word of God is living. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. So that is talking about its effectiveness to bring a difference in our lives. So it is sharp because if you have a knife that is not sharp, it doesn't become effective. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of, of joints and marrow and is a designer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There are some people who will say that the spirit and the soul are like warring between each other. The marrow and the, and the joints. But I want to pray that you will receive the word of God. You will receive the word of God as living, as powerful, as sharper than any two-edged sword that it may work in your life. That when you read the word of God, you'll allow it to reflect on you. That you may see your life in a mirror and that you may be able to live in according to the will of God. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is powerful. This message may sound simple, but I pray that the Lord will minister to you, minister to you in a big way in terms of how the word of God works in you. So may the Lord bless you very much um, for, for, for joining me um, this day. I pray that the Lord will do you well. I've unmuted you. I want to request um, my wife, uh, I can see she is on there, to pray as we close today. So Mary, um, are you there? Are you there? I want you to pray. Um, I'm asking my wife to pray. I don't know whether it's the network that is bad because I can't hear her. Okay, maybe the network at home is not very good, so we can't we can't hear her. So allow me to allow me to ask our brother. Um, sorry. Wow, we can't hear her. Margaret Mwangi, please pray for us as we close.